group of scientists have just announced that they plan to send Earth's location out into the cosmos, seemingly ignoring the late Stephen Hawking, and his comments about how we should be careful about how we approach the cosmos. The beacon in the Galaxy Project appears to be an updated Arecibo message, which for those unaware was a broadcast that came from the Arecibo radio telescope, and the message was to let anything out there listening know that we are here. The message that was sent out was a simple one. It consisted of a pictorial message giving basic information about humans and the planet we live on. An abstract from this new project titled A Beacon in the Galaxy, updated Arecibo message for potential FAST and SETI projects, reads as follows. An updated binary coded message has been developed for transmission to extraterrestrial intelligences in the Milky Way galaxy. The proposed message includes basic mathematical and physical concepts to establish a universal means of communication, followed by information on the biochemical composition of life on Earth, the solar system's timestamp position in the Milky Way relative to known clusters, as well as digitized depictions of the solar system and Earth's surface. The message concludes with images of the human form along with an invitation for any receiving intelligences to respond. End quote. Not everyone has been open to the idea of sending out this into the cosmos though, with some saying is it a good idea to be sending images of a man and a woman into space, along with information about our solar system, DNA, the various telescopes we have and also the composition of Earth. This led some to question whether the authors took into consideration whether hostile civilizations might be out there, and whether this was the best message to be sending, noting that it could leave us open. One user had this to say, Knowing how humans are and how we've treated our own kind, why do we think that civilizations would be any better? I respect the optimism, but did it cross their minds that there could be more hostile civilizations out there? Not sure how to feel about this one. Others also pointed out that the late Stephen Hawking warned against these kinds of actions, detailing that we need to be careful when approaching this subject. One of the most surprising of Dr. Stephen Hawking's predictions was his sudden transparency before his passing, and this was in regards to alien intervention. In fact, the late scientists claimed that alien contact would most likely occur within the next century, and went on to warn us about the potential disaster of trusting an alien species, and explains that not only should we remain vigilant, but that an advanced race would have motives that may be unpredictable, claiming further that any intelligent alien species could not ever be fully trusted, saying that we should stay away from sending messages into space because we don't know what's out there, and could be massively unprepared if something ever did answer. This is an interesting prediction, and may very well be the case over this next century as developments in space frame technologies are being worked on. Dr. Hawking said the following in regards to these messages. If you look at history, contact between humans and less intelligent organisms have often been disastrous from their point of view and encounters between civilizations with advanced versus primitive technologies have gone badly for the less advanced. Dr. Stephen Hawking also seemed to have had a tremendous amount of optimism relative to the coming ages of technological advancements and exploration when it came to space travel. Dr. Hawking argued that if such an extinction level event can be overcome, not only will humanity become far more united in its overall pursuits and motivations, but we will be a space faring species, one that will be able to keep afloat by mining for renewable resources. Dr. Stephen Hawking most notably refers to us as planetary colonizers, and makes the overall suggestion that not only will Earth be our home, but many other of the celestial bodies in our solar system may find themselves colonized equally as well. This appears to be an accurate prediction, as many new space agencies are gearing up to launch various missions. In fact, many estimates for project deadlines put the first colonies on Mars to occur in 2030, 
which is merely within the next 10 years. Not only this, but NASA has begun the process and paperwork as well as research necessary for long-term inhabitation of space-faring ships. With efforts being made to replicate the famous Von Braun research station, along with the robotics and developments necessary to create fully sustainable life supports. The abstract continues with the following. These powerful new beacons, the successors to the Arecibo radio telescope which transmitted the 1974 message upon which this expanded communication is based upon, can carry forward Arecibo's legacy into the 21st century. With this equally well-constructed communication from Earth's technological civilization. End quote. Others have said that it's incredible that we're sending out these types of missions into space, and that it shows that we're ready to take on the final frontier, while other users weren't so sure about these actions, and again questioned whether sending out all of this information was the best idea with some noting that it seems like we're banking on the fact that advanced civilizations will be peaceful. Jamelia Ha, who is involved in the project, said the following. Stephen Hawking's quote is absolutely inspiring, and my personal conclusion was that any species capable of understanding and interpreting our message will likely be equally if not more intelligent and wary of our existence. Thus, as long as contact is approached with a clear sun of peace, it can be assumed that the hopeful possibilities and discoveries that come alongside communication outweigh the risk. Another user had this to say, Let's just hope that nothing malicious detects these messages, as we've basically given them a breakdown of what we look like, our DNA and where we come from. Unlike typical missing 411 cases, the disappearance of Gunnar Peterson would also feature a heartfelt recovery, with Gunnar appearing to have been in perfect health at the time of his recovery. His account for exactly what caused his disappearance is a matter even more difficult to explain however, and is often remarked as one of the first true missing 411 cases dating as far back as the early 1950s. According to the Gunnar Peterson report, back on the 6th of August during the year 1950, Mr. Peterson had travelled to the Coville National Forest, located in the state of Washington only two miles south of the Canadian border with his entire family, to engage in a nice relaxing weekend vacation of hiking up and down the Churchill Mountain. Once at the National Forest, it became apparent to the family that the native wild-grown huckleberries were in season, and ripe for picking. This sudden realisation led the family to planning their day around picking huckleberries together on the side of Churchill Mountain, and spending the rest of the day having a picnic at the summit. Unfortunately for the Peterson family, as the group were picking huckleberries near the top of the mountain in open areas well within the line of sight of each other, the family suddenly noticed that the father and husband Gunnar Peterson was no longer within the sight of the family. Wondering where he'd gone off to, Gunnar's daughter Mrs. W.A. Graves had called out to her father several times, but got no response. At first the family was not worried about his temporary absence, believing that perhaps he had decided to use the restroom nearby or ventured into a more secluded area where he'd no longer be within earshot of the group. As the day stretched on, however, the group grew increasingly worried, as every member continued searching and calling out to Gunner, but getting no response. After seeing no son of Gunner for over three hours, the family would immediately call the local Stephen County Sheriff's Department and report 65-year-old Gunner as missing. Within only a few hours of being alerted, Sheriff Beryl Warren would bring together several dozen search and rescue volunteers, made up of local residents, fellow law enforcement officers, the National Park Forest Service personnel and several dozen soldiers from the local military base. The first night, the search and rescue volunteers focused on coming through the area where he'd last been seen with his family following any trails and areas that connected with wild huckleberry bushes that the father could have ventured off into. 
despite looking through every open huckleberry bush they found no son of Gunner. After the first two days of searching, law enforcement and search and rescue volunteers were growing increasingly desperate, due to the sudden drop in temperatures in the area and the light rain. Given the fact that the mountain stands at a height of almost 4,800 feet in elevation, and is filled with layers of lush thick forests and hundreds of small running bodies of water, search and rescue teams were growing increasingly concerned with the possibility of finding Gunner Peterson alive, as they believed that the train would have made it incredibly difficult for Mr. Peterson to have safely made his way down the mountain, while lost and alone. By the third day of Gunner Peterson's disappearance, a specialized canine search and rescue team was employed in the search that had come from Idaho and eastern Washington. After the family supplied the dogs with clothes and shoes that Gunner Peterson had worn, the dogs followed the scent into the middle of a huckleberry bush path, where Mr. Peterson had been seen by his family. Oddly enough, the sheriff would remark that the canine seemed confused as to where the trail continued and were unable to maintain Gunner's scent for long before losing it entirely. After seven days of looking for Mr. Peterson, search and rescue volunteers started to give up hope on finding Mr. Peterson alive, causing the search efforts to slowly taper off, as law enforcement, military personnel and forest servicemen had the primary goal of finding a body, and no longer a living person. The search for Mr. Peterson would continue for another three days, until Gunner's daughter and her husband would find Gunner more than five miles away. According to Gunner Peterson's daughter, she and her husband continued searching for her father in a circling radius that would lead them five miles away from the base of Churchill Mountain. As they were in the area, they started to notice a collection of abandoned houses and shacks, seemingly constructed in the middle of nowhere. According to the locals of the region, the houses had been constructed many years ago, and were at the centre of what was referred to as high strangeness, with many of the locals too scared or superstitious to venture into the areas. As they searched through the abandoned shacks, Gunner's daughter would find Gunner sleeping in one of the abandoned buildings, seemingly in perfect health. According to Gunner Peterson, he had survived in the area for 10 days primarily by drinking rainwater and living off huckleberries as his main food source. Oddly enough, at the time of his recovery, Gunnar Peterson had only been aware of 8 days that had passed and had no idea that he'd been missing for a little over 10 days since the search began. When search and rescue volunteers and investigators questioned Gunnar Peterson as to how he appeared to have disappeared from the region, it became obvious that something far more bizarre had happened. Gunnar Peterson claimed when talking to investigators that he had been picking huckleberries with his family only a few feet from the group, when he suddenly felt a large mass strike the back of his head. He would then wake up sometime during the middle of the night in pitch black darkness, believing that a falling limb or ruck must have knocked him unconscious. Oddly enough, there were no marks or sign of damage against Mr. Peterson's head, and he'd been standing in an open field of bushes on the side of the highest point of the mountain, where any falling debris would have been difficult to explain. Even more bizarre, however, was that Mr. Peterson counted only seven days having passed after he'd awoken from his unconscious state. This led him to believe that he must have been knocked unconscious for a period of over two days, as he was unable to account for two of the ten days that had been missing, originally believing that he'd only been missing for eight days. So what do you make of this mysterious disappearance? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below, and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.